Good morning and thanks for joining us on The Big Story. And what we're talking about today can be something which perhaps rattles more nerves after holders of participatory notes continue to be jittery over what will be tax and what won't be. It's now perhaps the turn of the private equity part of the market to feel the tax burden. The budget states, and I quote, uh, share premium in excess of the fair market value to be treated as income. This, as many industry watchers have commented, could very well be a bit of a death blow to private equity investment in the unlisted space. How serious is the matter? What is at stake? And will unlisted small startup firms find it very difficult to access capital? Well, those are some big questions staring us in the face. And joining me to discuss all this, Raja Lahiri, Partner Transaction Advisory Services at Grant Thornton India, Boris Kaka, Corporate Lawyer, and with me here in the studio, Prakash Nene, MD and CFO of uh, Multiple Equities. Thanks, Prakash, so much for joining in. And Puneet Shah, Head of Private Equity at KPMG. Puneet, once again, thanks for taking out the time. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Porus. If you could just, you know, throw some light on this, because it was a small little mention in one of the side notes. These things get missed in the, ba in the you know, the big budget speech. But is it as clear as what we think right now that any investment com coming into an unlisted startup firm or an unlisted firm Anything which is valued above face value or fair market value will now attract income tax? Yes. If you are not able to explain it substantially to the officer and you fail the test which is laid down, which is an asset-based test. But one thing you must note is that this comes under the bracket of measures to avoid tax avoidance. And I think if the government felt that there was a problem, they needed perhaps a tool, but the tool is perhaps too wide and there could have been a better way which is in fact there in the budget because this is too wide, it affects private equity across the board and though there is a provision where you explain it substantially to the officer you may get away but currently as it reads the fair market value test may be difficult for them to get over. Um, Puneet, let me again get this broad understanding with you as well because what has come out in the provision and I'll, I'll just you know take a quick quote here, what they're saying is that if the consideration received in excess of face value and also the fair market value will be considered for taxation, uh, the question is who will determine what is fair market value or are they saying that anything above face value, so if a private equity investor comes in and is willing to buy equity into the company above the face value, which might be 5 rupees, 10 rupees, all of that will come under the tax ambit? Uh, I think uh, there are uh, two points which I would like to make. First of all, uh, the provision applies to... Uh, no, residents only and therefore uh, it's a matter of debate whether the offshore private equity investors would be uh, hit by, by uh, this amendment. So that's that's number one. Uh, so far as residents are concerned, yes, they are supposed to uh, justify the share premium uh, which they are going to put in in the unlisted companies and uh, uh, they have prescribed two methods. One is the book value based method and second is any other method which an assessee can substantiate uh, with the tax officer uh, and therefore it's quite subjective in that sense. So obviously the assessee, the resident assessee has to uh, explain to the, to the tax officer as to the justification as to why the amount has been put uh, at a higher premium than what could be justified as per the share valuation as per the prescribed methods. But I just want to go back to the first of those points. The first and foremost clarification that is required is whether this will apply only to private equity and venture cap funds based out of India or offshore. You're saying it appears right now that it will apply only to domestic based funds. That's right. Let me let me clarify that. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, that particular provision applies only to uh, domestic uh, investors, first of all. So it does not apply to overseas investors, number one. Number two, even under domestic investors, uh, they have carved out uh, uh, exception for the domestic venture capital fund. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it would typically apply to angel investors kind of thing, th those who are not registered with SEBI, so to say. Okay. And okay. therefore, it seems to be a clear attempt mm -hmm. to drive several unregistered investors to go and get registration with mm -hmm. SEBI. So I think I think that's one way of looking at it, number one. Okay. Let me try and get yeah. that same interpretation from Raja as well. Raja, how have you interpreted what has been announced? Let's go to the bare basics. Whom will this apply to? Angel investors, private equity firms, only investors based out of India or perhaps there's also some kind of a sub-clause hidden somewhere that may bring foreign investors also under the ambit? So in my view, I think, uh, you know, what Purit shared, I completely agree, agree with him uh, in the sense that this completely makes sure that, you know, the domestic venture capital funds and the private equity funds which are registered with SEBI, uh, they are actually outside the ambit of this clause. 
Uh, but you know what's interesting to note is, uh, you know, clearly the angel investors clearly come under this uh, ambit, uh, which which means that you know if you're making an investment in, <clears throat> let's say, tech companies like the e-commerce companies, you know, fair market value is really is really uh, is anybody's guess. So there could be a substantial amount of premium in build there. So we could definitely have some uh, interesting debate and litigations around that. But the other aspect is. Um, is uh, if, if you're talking about portfolio companies of private equity funds operating in India, and if they make strategic investments in, in other companies uh, as a strategic equity stake, uh, this clause could put, put potentially be applicable. Uh, and, and, and that's obviously a cause of concern for some of the larger funds. Okay, so I mean basically what you're trying to suggest is and I'm just taking a name here only for example, only for reference, absolutely no intent otherwise. But let's say for example, if uh, Blackstone India makes an investment in an Indian unlisted entity, then that could be under the tax ambit. Is that the point you're trying to make? No, what I was trying to say is that if, if, if a, a private equity fund invests in a portfolio company and that portfolio company takes another equity stake, in, in, in another company, you know, as part of a strategic acquisition. Uh, in that case, the share premium clause could, could be applicable. And that's something uh, which does not affect the private equity funds directly, but it affects the portfolio company of the private equity company. Okay, got that. All right. Uh, Prakash, your reading, uh, how serious yeah, is this? Look, I think this is quite serious because uh, I heard, uh, I mean, these gentlemen, I also heard some other lawyers and who have been talking about it. There are a lot of ambiguities in the whole thing. First of all, even, let me clarify, even for a domestic venture capital fund, many times what happens, you in invest through an SPV because you want to lever it. So you take a leverage on an SPV and that SPV invests rather than investing directly as a yeah. Private, yeah. Private, private equity. So the transaction, because you don't take the leverage on the fund itself, you sure. create a 100% subsidiary, sure. you take a leverage on that and then invest. Sure. So when the SPV invests, that's not covered here. They have not said directly or indirectly uh, domestic venture capital is out. So that's com concern number one. So you're saying that's an ambiguous area. You don't know what happens if the investment is rooted through the SPV. Yes. Number two, okay. uh, the, the very fact is that most of the private equity is nowadays when you invest in a company and we have also been investing what happens that you look for some m a transaction mm -hmm. you want to bulk up the companies you want to make sure that the companies in the similar kind of uh, different kind of skills they come, come under set, same set so m a is one primary objective of entering to a private equity investment into a domestic portfolio company so that they grow up sure. so those things obviously they come into this uh, entire picture mm -hmm. now as far as the foreign funds are concerned again foreign funds can invest through an spv then mm -hmm. the first question remains mm -hmm. And I have been told that there are, I mean, there is section 68 which talks about some exceptions for domestic funds is silent on the non-resident investment. The section says that if there is a domestic fund, even if you explain the share premium, uh, it is not sufficient. I mean, there is still, whereas it doesn't talk about foreign funds at all. So we are left with the feeling that there is lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. So overall, there are many other issues, but mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. to these issues, we, we remain very concerned. So just to reiterate what the point that all our experts are making, that yes, life is going to change because there will be a tax. If you are an unlisted company and you're getting in any kind of strategic equity investor, a private equity investor, then whatever premium this investor is paying you on that premium, yes, there will be the tax. But Porus, now moving to the second point, how much tax? Who is to determine what, de what you know, contributes towards the premium? What is fair value? How will this be arrived at? Well, the fair value is laid down in the provision and unfortunately the only safety valve which is you can explain it satisfactorily to the officer is again linked with the fair market value test. So for example, as uh, one of the panelists mentioned, take companies in the technology sector, you cannot explain satisfactorily to the officer how you valued your uh, angel investment because obviously it will not be linked through the assets and the officer thereafter doesn't have any flexibility. So I think that definitely is a problem. And when you look again, coming back to what I said earlier, the objective is undoubtedly laudable to prevent the, the rotating of unaccounted money. But I think the remedy is too wide. And perhaps what we need to look at is already within the same finance bill, there is a provision under which resident companies are required to show the source of the source of their investors, the credit worthy of their Indian investors. And I think that provision will be sufficient because you're shifting the onus, et cetera, et cetera. Thereafter, you create a new provision to tax the share premium, which is too wide 
which may affect private equity may not be required. So perhaps the remedy is too wide and coming back to your answer, the tax will probably be at 30% of the, of, the, of the premium value if that is to be taken as, as, as a tax, taxable income under section 56. So we need a, we need a little bit more safety measures if this provision is to remain at all. Consider whether really the amendment to 68 suffices and you don't need an other measure. If you still require this, then I think you need to give other mechanisms for valuation and flexibility to show that when there is a genuine private equity investor, that person does not get caught in the tax net. I'm just quoting from a VC release here, Ran. Puneet, I want you to come in on this. Obviously, I mean, people are very upset out there and, and they've written and I'm quoting them, this will kill angel investing and give birth to stillborn startups in India. Is it as drastic as that? Uh, let me let me just uh, clarify a few things because I think there are two amendments which have happened simultaneously under section 56 and as Prakash mentioned under section 68 and therefore this confusion and I think Poras rightly mentioned that at least you will get caught in one of the sections. Mm. So if you look at section 68, it always existed on statute okay. which actually said that any credit, any, any credit whether it is share capital, whether it is premium could be taxed as income if the assessing officer comes to conclusion that this cannot be explained by the by the taxpayer in so India. So how, how, how was that taxpayer explaining it till now? So it's like, it was like, a, I wouldn't say it was a dormant uh, kind of section, mm -hmm. but it was not very uh, widely used uh, by the tax officers. Of course, it was used mainly for mm -hmm. intercorporate loans in India and stuff like that. Okay. But any of these amendments now is putting spotlight on these kind of transactions and therefore, mm -hmm. uh, tax office uh, revenue authorities may become more aware in okay. terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the need to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, take mm -hmm. shelter under any of these sections. Sure, sure. So that was section so 68 that, which always existed. That's right and what an amendment has been made is that if resident again uh, puts in money like that, in that case the, uh, the, the receiver of the money has to explain the source and the source of the source. So mm -hmm. that's the only amendment which has been made and mm -hmm. therefore again so to say overseas investors are spared in that sense from the uh, amendment of section 68 as well. Mm -hmm. However, the original position remains that they are always subject to an explanation or subject to uh, a clarification uh, uh, by the by the uh, revenue authority. So that, that position always remains number one. And so far as these comments are concerned, uh, I think one good thing has happened is that both under section 56 and 68, mm -hmm. the venture capital funds, mm -hmm. domestic venture capital funds are kept outside. Okay. the purview of both the sections in that sense. So if a domestic venture capital fund is making an investment in a company A, an unlisted company, that's then right. these provisions don't apply? That, then they do not uh, apply. The registered venture capital that's fund. That's right. Registered venture capital funds. Funds. Registered and unregistered. Yes. Sure, so the sure, people sure. who are registered with CV, mm -hmm. those yes. kind of registered venture capital fund is what he means. And, sure. and, and that's why I go back to my original point that uh, it will certainly encourage mm -hmm. uh, registration with SEBI and I think uh, mm -hmm. that's one way, it's mm -hmm. it's the right way to look at the entire uh, so, fee industry so in that then, uh, Prakash, what is the big hue and cry over then? I mean, at least for venture capital funds, you register, you can still invest and there's no question of taxation. Then what's the hue and cry? You know, there is a huge mm -hmm. problem. I mean, registration also gives you a lot of constraints. Mm -hmm. A registered venture capital fund can invest only in unlisted companies, 66 percent, 33 percent only in listed companies. They cannot, there are a lot of do's and do's, uh, don'ts for the, uh, for the registration. You cannot invest in NBFC, you cannot invest in many other things. Mm -hmm. So the people who are angel investors, people who want to, really people who want to do venture investing in the real sense, tech sector and those areas, New they, ideas, they, they, yeah. they don't want to get uh, caught into these kind of so many restrictions. There's a lot of filings and restrictions. You don't want to get into all that mm -hmm. and those are the those are entrepreneur kind of people who want to really back a particular idea sure. now now as everybody is saying that the section says it is asset amendment also says okay if it is not fair value based on asset you can still have it but it should be franchisee licenses all those things again are good will asset related no mm -hmm. but normally venture capital what happens you are making losses for three four years and okay. you continue to make losses you'll never have let me let me get in raja into the conversation back again raja you've been hearing both sides of the argument i mean there's this one thought process which says that if you're a registered venture capital fund then really nothing's really changed for you but then the counter argument to that is that you know it really inhibits the kind of investments that you can make so how serious is this impact going to be you think so in my view, uh, I think as you rightly pointed it out, uh, this, this possibly impacts the angel investors. Uh, as of now, you know, given, given some of the conversations that I've been having with other funds, uh, you know, if you're, if you're re really SEBI registered, this, this clause doesn't really apply. 
Uh, however, you know, if, if you're looking at angel investors who are really focused on the tech sector, the e-commerce sector, you know, you know, these kind of intellectual property kind of focused uh, sectors, this section definitely impacts. Uh, and, 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 and the beauty of this clause is that, you know, the section does not really talk about how do you determine the fair market value. And as Prakash rightly said, you know, it's very difficult to actually ascertain fair market value because some of these companies would be at losses. So, you know, you know, you, you've got to have a very specific section or a, or a guidance in terms of how you value some of these companies. And me, you know, personally, having looked at valuations, uh, it's a very subjective subject here. Sure. So, so I think the angel investors definitely get impacted. Uh, I per se don't see uh, significant concern for the domestic semi-registered funds at this stage. Um, uh, but but yes, uh, you know, uh, the angel investing uh, is going to take a sure, take concern sure. and a hit. You know, be before we go back to Porus for a last word, I just want the um, the other experts to come in on this. We've discussed in angel investing. Uh, what about private equity? Uh, Raja, do you want to take up on that as well? I mean, what are we really talking about? If there is 30% tax, if this starts getting treated as income, do you see deals drying up even more or people having, you know, more of a second thought? As far as private equity is concerned, I don't think this section is going to impact uh, private equity transactions. Uh, I think I think this section directly impacts the angel investors. So as far as private equity deals goes, I, I don't see uh, a major impact, impact. I think as I said in my earlier comment, uh, if, if a portfolio company of a private equity fund is going to make some strategic investments or doing an m and I think that could be a, a, a cause of concern. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the objective of the section is to really uh, track unaccounted money, but not to prohibit m and So we have to see how that pans out, really. Is that how you're seeing it as well? Yes. And I, uh, maybe a couple of more comments. Mm -hmm. First is that tax is not the only mechanism whereby you would try and discourage this kind of uh, investments. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to discourage black money, if you want to discourage hot money, volatile money, whatever you say, there are other mechanisms under SEBI regulations, RBI regulations, round tripping issues, mm -hmm. etc., which you can always, uh, there are KYC norms sure. uh, which are regulators put mm -hmm. in. So I think those were the measures where you could try and ensure that the money which is coming in India is clean mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. it's not uh, volatile money kind of thing. What about your reading on what it does to private equity m in the country? I think uh, it should not have a large impact uh, on private equity activities in India. Uh, especially because overseas investors are not, to my mind, impacted by this. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, as I said, Section 68 always exist, uh, mm -hmm. existed on the statute. And I am, I am aware, um, in some cases, definitely the tax office has invoked that particular section to examine the source of the share capital which has come into mm -hmm. Indian uh, companies. Uh, but that has always existed and therefore mm -hmm. uh, nothing new has uh, been brought uh, on statute. So, so I don't think there's a... So you're saying that even if it's an international private equity giant yes. doing the transaction through an India-based SPV or an India-based offshoot, they will not be under the ambit of this new amendment? Uh, actually, as per the law, that typically doesn't work mm -hmm. because uh, the overseas investor would put in money directly into sure. the company. While a domestic, and as mm -hmm. Prakash rightly mm -hmm. said, domestic fund could use SPV to make uh, to put mm -hmm. investment uh, mm -hmm. in the domestic sure. uh, operating sure. companies, mm -hmm. that would definitely could get impacted, even sure. though that doesn't seem to be the intention. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think there is a clarification which is required sure. that VCF, directly or indirectly, making an investment into operating company should not be impacted mm -hmm. by this. And I think it's a matter of clarification rather mm -hmm. than, mm -hmm. uh, to my mind, intentional uh, uh, hit on them. Prakash, quick last thought before I go back to Porus, your total yeah, yeah. sense on this. Yeah, I mean, the mm -hmm. question here is that intentions are laudable of the government about the black money. And nobody can have any dispute with that. But as you heard from everybody, we have to have a policy, we have to have a regime which is very, very clear and transparent. I mean, if you have in between these lines and fine prints and somebody, you get a plethora of lawyers to interpret the whole thing, then you get concerned. Even if there is no concern, you'll get concerned. Sure. So you require f full clarification of these aspects. I think that's what we, we should all be looking forward to. Boris, back to you then for your final thoughts when I mean, everyone's talking about the intent here. You know, is this some kind of, uh, you know, uh, tax engineering that is coming out or some creative thinking that's coming out of the revenue department because of what we know the situation is on the fiscal and the revenue front? Or is this a genuine case here for uh, coming out and, you know, making this amendment? Well, obviously, they must have come across some transactions under which they have found share premium perhaps disguising unaccounted money. But it is strange because ultimately, as uh, one of your panelists mentioned, 
you are looking at taxing value. Now value is very subjective in say a loss making company going forward. So you are significantly going to affect angel investors and I am not sure whether you may even affect the private equity. When you are looking at taxing unaccounted money, you are not looking at the value of it. You are looking at what is the source, what is the amount. And therefore, when you have already a provision which provides that the person in India has to provide the credit worthiness of the source, I think perhaps that is a better way of going about it rather than this wide rule which undoubtedly I don't think the government intended to affect equity and private equity and angel investors and it should not affect the research and the, the, the startups that we want to do. So I think there requires some rethinking and it's certainly also the safety valves. Right now acid based test is not really the correct way because take Infosys, you really we find it difficult to value it on that basis. There are industries where valuations will vary from person to person and it certainly won't be on an asset based test. So I think to be fair to the government, the intention was not to cover this. There perhaps a better way to tackle this and I hope that that comes about in the budget when the final bill is placed in parliament. So Porus, once again to just recap this, what are the kind of key clarifications that you would want to hear from the finance minister or from the tax department uh, in order to make sure that this doesn't turn into some kind of a demon or monster but indeed uh, you know very legitimate uh, case by the tax department well two things firstly really consider whether you need this provision when you already are amending section 68 if you still feel you need it then expand the safety valves to ensure that as long as the source is proved, as long as the credit worthiness of the source is proved, there is no blanket addition of the share premium because the value that a person puts on it is really subjective to what he thinks going forward. And as long as he can show that this is not any unaccounted money, it should not get caught in the tax net. And of course, expand the value criteria from just an asset based test but frankly, I'm not sure how you would expand it to an, to, to an even an earnings method because as you said, loss making companies, you cannot even capitalize their earnings. So this is very subjective when you put it in the context of an angel investor and therefore to tax value, I think will be difficult. What criteria they will lay down, they'll have to consider, but certainly they should not cover private equity, angel investments in this country. All right, tax black money or unaccounted money if you have to, but perhaps leave out genuine value that is being created by innovating companies. Gentlemen, thanks so much for taking out the time and being with us. Porus and Raja, thanks for taking out your time. And gentlemen, thank you, Puneet and Prakash. Appreciate your thoughts. Of course, it's an issue that we've not seen the last on for sure. The debate will perhaps continue going on. Absolutely. Well, that's it on the big story for now. Thanks for being with us.